Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. All righty, hallelujah. You know, it's funny how these things work. Uh, this message, I started putting it together several weeks ago. <laughs> and the pastor came in this morning and said, can you preach tonight? And I went, oh yeah. Because <laughs> I'd already put this together for the most part. But I did some more study this afternoon and, and got some more things together. But this, this comes out of... This comes out of my spirit. This comes out of my heart uh, for some of the things that's been going on. And I will say this. What pastor ministered this morning is part one of this. I mean, it is Holy Ghost 100%. And I will encourage those of you that are watching via our uh, YouTube channel and our other video capabilities, if you want to go back and listen to this morning's message, by pastor, it will tie in perfectly for this message tonight. So it is literally part one, part two. So we're tag teaming. Hallelujah. All righty, let's pray and get into the word this evening. Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come together and to receive from your word. Father, we just believe that there's a special anointing, a special gracing for this time that we live in. Father, this is the hour. This is the time that we've been called to. And so we know that you have anointed us for this time, and I'm talking about the whole church, the whole body of Christ has been anointed to live and to function in this time, and we thank you for that. Father, we just believe that we'll receive and learn about that here this evening. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you had to guess what I'm going to teach on, I guarantee that you would not guess, knowing me and what I teach, we're going to talk about Christian suffering. <laughs> Hallelujah! Can you imagine Dr. Bill talking about Christian suffering? Well, what we have to understand is there, there is a kind of Christian suffering the Bible says that we will have. But it is not what most people teach. And we know, as Word of Faith believers, that we are not to suffer physical sickness and disease as a punishment from God. You know, we're not to be... Uh, a lot of people believe that suffering is what will perfect us and purify us in the last days and that that's what's going to make us able to wear white robes. Now, believe it or not, there was a time... Now, I'm talking... Wow. The late 60s, early 70s, probably, when I was studying end times teaching back then, I actually bought into that for a period of time. Now, that was... That was before I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So cut me some slack. <laughs> All right. The teacher had not yet come to indwell me. <laughs> so uh, some of the squirrely doctrines that were going around, I jumped in on. And one of them was that Christians had to go through the tribulation in order to be purified to wear robes of white. Well, common Christian sense, common biblical sense would tell you that is completely wrong and completely bogus. Because it's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us, not our suffering. Okay? So how we get into those kinds of teachings, it's the devil. Okay? I mean, there's no question. So I learned better, and I found out better, and I read the Word of God, and I studied it out, and we're good. Okay? <laughs> but that was, that was going around back then. And, uh, you know, I... Uh, I could mention a name of a prominent uh, Christian TV station owner who still believes it. So I won't go any further on that. But at any rate, no, the Bible does not teach that Christians have to suffer sickness or distress or car crashes or losing children or any other number of things in order to have any positive benefit in our lives. But it does specifically say Christians will suffer, but it's knowing what they're going to suffer. The title of this message is Christian Suffering. What are we to suffer? Okay? What are we to suffer? We're to suffer persecution. 
Now that's not because we want it. <laughs> not because we're believing for it. But as Pastor says sometimes, you know, uh, the evil day's coming. And it's coming whether you believe one thing or another or not. It's what you do in the evil day that makes the difference. Well, the persecution is coming. In fact, is here in the world. Much more so in other parts of the world than here, physically yet. Okay? <clears throat> but some of the things that have been happening lately, particularly with regard to supposed gay marriage, I don't like that term, uh, you know, sodomite marriage, that's another way of putting it, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, it's certainly not biblical marriage, it's certainly not scriptural marriage, and never will be. Right. However, the world has been trained that gay marriage, in quotes, is perfectly normal and perfectly fine. We've been taught that, say we, people generally in the United States, have been taught that incrementally through television shows, yeah. through newscasters, through articles and magazines. It's been a slow, maybe not slow exactly, but insidious step-by-step -step retraining right. of people to the point that as Christians, if we resist that, we're evil yeah. in their eyes. Well, the scripture says that in the last days, there will be those that call good evil and evil good. And that's exactly a perfect example of what this is. So let's look at a few scriptures here. One that comes to mind uh, to me is Psalm 913. This is no covenant scripture. The rest of these will all be New Testament. But Old Testament scripture in Psalm 913 says, Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble, which I suffer of them that hate me that thou liftest me up from the gates of death. Now think about that. People are calling Christians hate mongers and hate speech. And if you read Romans 1 and talk about how a man lying with a man is an abomination, that's hate speech. It's not hate speech. It's scripture. You know, don't argue with me about it. Argue with God. He's the one who said it. You know, I don't... I personally don't have an axe to grind. Really. I don't care personally one way or another other than what the Scripture says. That's the only reason I care is what the Scripture says. And the fact that that person, if they believe they're okay with God and continue in that lifestyle, will go to hell. There, I care. I'm called on to care. God tells me that I should care. So to just flip a switch and turn that off and say, oh no, 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 I, I'm not going to get involved in any of that. We can't do that. We just can't. And so that puts us at odds with the world. Now let's look at some of these other scriptures that we have here. Matthew 5, let's look at Matthew 5 beginning in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Think about that. Persecuted for righteousness sake. Well, the scripture is plain of what's right and wrong. The scripture, and pastor was talking about this this morning in his message. The Bible makes it clear that God loves righteousness and hates iniquity. Well, <laughs> if we're persecuted for righteousness sake, the scripture says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Hallelujah. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. See, there's that persecution. And shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Is that not what is happening? All of that, this could be taken from the headlines of the paper. This is happening right now. Rejoice. Now, a lot of people would see that and look at that and say, wait a minute, they're persecuting me, I'm suffering persecution, they're saying all these manner, these all manner of evil against me falsely for, for, for Jesus' sake? I mean, come on, rejoice. See, what's our attitude to be when we're persecuted? Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. You are the salt, are the preservative of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, where when shall it be salted? Now, we're used to refrigerators. We're used to all kinds of methods now 
to, uh, to keep meat fresh. All they had back then, they didn't have refrigerators. All they had back then was salt. They salted meat. And that's how they preserved it. They kept it from rotting. Well, this world, hate to tell you, is rotten. It is rotten with sin. It is rotten with rebellion. It's rotten with lawlessness. And if we as Christians aren't the salt, the preservative, then that world will just crumble. Have you ever seen an apple? Bright red, nice apple. You leave it out and it starts rotten and it starts getting smaller and crinkled and brown and then finally black and then it finally just crumbles away. The world would do that if it weren't for Christians. We're the preservative of this earth. And when we're removed, <laughs> now unlike what I used to believe way back about having to go through the tribulation, I know that we don't have to go through the tribulation, hallelujah. We're going to be taken out in the rapture of the church and God's getting us out of here. When that happens, when the, when the church leaves the earth, the rot is going to get worse so quick. It'll just be phenomenal. Now, it's already pretty bad. And I'm convinced that a lot of the reason is we're losing our saltiness. We, the body of Christ. I have no intention of losing my saltiness. But there are those who have. And that's exactly what he says here. You're the salt of the earth, but if the salt's losing its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and be trodden underfoot. Ye are the light of the world. That is our function, to be a preservative and to be light. We're the light of the world. If we don't like the world, nobody will. If Christians don't like the world, the world will remain dark and get darker. And if we shut up and give up and just say, forget it, I'm just going to wait till the Lord takes me home, then the light's going to get dimmer and it's going to get worse. The only thing we can do as believers is to believe God, pray, pray for those that are in authority. My goodness, pray for those that are in authority. And believe for mercy for this world. We should be praying for mercy. Neither do men light a candle but, uh, and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, that it giveth light unto all that are in the house. 16. 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. Hallelujah. Well, we don't have to do good works. We just live by grace. Forget that mess. Praise the Lord for grace. I'm all for grace. But I'm also for works. There's nothing wrong with doing the works of Jesus. There's nothing wrong with doing the works of the, of the Word of God. There's absolutely everything the Word of God says that they may see your good works. If they're not seeing our good works, what's the matter with us? Now, glorify your Father which is in heaven. Think not that I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot nor tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till it all be fulfilled. So the law's not going anywhere. It's just not going anywhere. It's still there. God still expects people to live a holy life. That may be a shock to a lot of folks. There's probably a lot of people watching this right now going, wait a minute. No, it's the truth. It's not going to pass away until it all be fulfilled. Whosoever shall break one of these of the least of commandments shall, uh, and shall teach men also, he shall be called the least of the kingdom of heaven. Now let me th think about that just a minute. If you'll break these commandments and teach men so, in other words, teach them to break commandments, teach them to live however they want to live and forget the Bible, he'll be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them to obey the word of God, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You know what? I want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I don't know about you. I would much rather be the one teaching until the end that they should be obeying the word of God. And that's my commitment to do that. Now, notice up there it said in verse 14, ye are the light of the world. We, Christians, are the light of the world. Our light reveals their sin. Talking about the world. John 3.15, let's look at that. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have uh, eternal life. Very familiar scripture to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, it really was not his intention to condemn the world. His interest was in saving the world. That was why he sent Jesus. He that believed on him is not condemned. The he that believeth not... Think about all those folks out there in the world that believe not on purpose, like Pastor was talking about this morning, about those particular uh, Greek words. Those that by decision choose to rebel against the word of God, they believe not, they're condemned already. Because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. Jesus is the light that came into the world. But we're the body of Christ now. We're the light that's in the world. Light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their, their uh, deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil, evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Now up there earlier we read, over in Matthew, that we're the light of the world. Here it says, these guys hate the light. So what do they do to us? They hate us. And that's what that earlier scripture said in Psalms. I suffer of them that hate me. They hate Christians. They do. And all you got to do is look at some of the articles that you see on the internet about Christians are against science, Christians are against global warming, Christians are, Christians are a bunch of idiots, they're so stupid. On and on, they're always running down believers because we dare have the audacity to believe the Word of God. They hate us because of that. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. I'd rather have my deeds wrought in God every time. Acts 5.41 And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. This is the attitude we need to get as believers today, living in this time that we live right now. I am counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. When people, I've had people at work, had a guy tell me, you need to shut up about this Christian stuff, it's going to hurt your career. I don't care. Not a whit. And I told him that. I said, I don't care about that. I care about the Word of God. God meets my need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter where I work. If they were to kick me out tomorrow, I'd get a better job with better finances because God's going to take care of me, but I will not bend when it comes to the things of God. I'm just going to be a Christian right in front of their face. And I tell you what, we've got homosexual guys and homosexual girls working right there where I am. I don't go out of my way to do anything mean to them. I see them in the hall, hi, how you doing? And they just look at me like, eh. They don't have anything much to do with me. But it's not because of me, it's because of the light. Because of the word. Because they know I'm a believer. Personally, no problem at all. But they don't like what I believe. That's what it's going to come down to more and more in these last of the last days that we're living in. But what we ought to do is say, well, praise the Lord. I'm counted worthy to suffer shame for his name's sake. Hallelujah. Acts 9, 16. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Talking about Paul. Paul was told specifically, I'm going to show you what you're going to suffer. These are the kinds of sufferings that Christians have to deal with. Suffering things for his name's sake. The fact that people don't like believers these days. Like, just about like they did back then. They didn't like them back then either. In Paul's day. Let me show you some of the things you're going to suffer. But you know what? Go back up to that earlier verse. I count it joyful, rejoicing that I'm worthy to suffer for his name's sake. Galatians 6.12, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, talking about, this is particularly, I'm looking at it in talking about uh, false doctrine. The circumcision was false doctrine. There was no reason for them to be circumcised as believers. And really, Jew or, or Gentile, but particularly they were fussing about the Gentiles a lot, not being circumcised. Well, we didn't need to circumcise them. Why? Jesus did away with all of that. So Paul stood up and said, no, you don't have to circumcise them. That was very controversial back then. It was a doctrine, the circumcision doctrine was a false doctrine. So let's look at it this way and kind of read it that way. <clears throat> they constrain you to live according to a false doctrine. 
only lest they suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, what he was saying here is, you're going to suffer because you're not accepting their false doctrine. I tell you what, there's a lot of people that want me to accept greasy grace doctrine. I won't do it. I won't teach it. I'll never teach it. I'll never accept it. And people go, well, you ought to. That's walking in love. Walking in love is preaching the truth. Walking in love is making a stand on the Word of God and being serious about it. And not just saying, well, I'll go along, I'll go along. No, don't go along. Get serious about the Word of God. That's what he's talking about here. Uh, Philippians 1, 29. For unto you is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here to be in me. Suffer for His sake. Now, there's some things we're not to suffer. I talked about sickness and disease. I talked about calamity of various kinds. There's things we can stand up against and not, and not have to suffer. <laughs> Let's look at some of those. 1 Peter 4, 15. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, okay, or a thief, or an evildoer, or a busybody, uh-oh, in other men's matter, matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Right there, we can underline that. That's what we're talking about tonight. There's a lot of things we don't have to suffer, but we will suffer as a Christian. If we make the kind of solid stand we're talking about here tonight, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God that we're suffering as a Christian. Now, 2 Timothy 3.10, Thou hast known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions. There it is. Paul suffered persecutions. Afflictions are pressures. That's the Greek word thalipsis. It means pressure. Which came upon me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. You can expect to be delivered. See, I don't, I don't want you to get the idea that I'm teaching that Christians ought to suffer and just go, well, hallelujah, you're supposed to suffer. We get delivered out of them all. We should expect that. That's what he said. Look at all these things. Persecution, pressure, affliction. You know, but you've seen what I've been doing. My teaching, my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long-suffering, we could say patience, my divine love or charity, uh, patience, persecutions, afflictions, all those things that came at me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If we're living godly in Christ Jesus and taking a stand against this homosexual marriage mess and taking a stand against things like sanctuary cities that are causing murders to happen because cities are saying, I defy the law of the land. Think about that. Talk about the mystery of lawlessness that's already at work. I had a message about 2011 or thereabouts the mystery of lawlessness out of the amplified version it talks about there's a mystery of lawlessness already at work and that lawlessness is that last Greek word that pastor talked about this morning where you are lawless you see what the requirements are you see what the rules are you see what the laws are and you say no I reject it I'm a lawless on purpose I make a decision a quality decision to be against God it's what those cities are doing, those sanctuary cities. Sounds real pretty, but all they're doing is saying, I defy the law of the land. That's what that's about. But God's going to deliver us out of all these things. Now, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But what are we to do? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. It'd be nice to tell the whole body of Christ, guys, brethren, you need to go back and look at all the things you've learned, that sin is sin, that faith is faith, that grace has its proper place, but it's not greasy. <laughs> all of these things, 
Know who you learned them from. Skinny jeans guys don't have the truth. As pastor talks about the skinny jeans guys. You know, they don't. They're teaching lies. They're teaching false doctrine. And people are getting sucked into that stuff, and it's hurting them. But it goes on to say here in verse 15, uh, 2 Timothy 3.15, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, hallelujah, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God or is spoken out of God's own mouth, is what the Greek says, and is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. That's what we ought to be doing. Back to the Word of God. I posted something on Facebook this morning about how back in my Southern Baptist Mills home, first, you know, Baptist Church at Mills home, vacation Bible school, we would stand up and pledge allegiance to the American flag. And then we would pivot slightly and pledge allegiance to the Christian flag. And then one of the, the uh, kids there in vacation Bible school would hold his Bible up. And we pledge allegiance to the Bible. And this morning when I woke up, going through my mind was that pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. It will be a light unto my feet and a lamp unto my path. I will hide it in my heart that I may not sin against God. Think about that. And I posted on Facebook, I said, if, we, if everybody here today in the nation had gone through what I went through. I tell you what, when I stood there and pledged allegiance to the American flag, I got choked up. It was like a lump in my throat. I got teared up because I love my country. And I'd look at the Christian flag and everything that it stands for, and I would pledge allegiance to that, and I'd tear up. And then they would hold up the Bible, and it was like, oh, praise the Lord, God's holy word. That's what we got to go back to. If our children today had come up the way we came up, with that awe and that respect for the things of God and for our nation and, and, and be patriotic about our nation, think of the difference it would make with all the mess that's going on and all the junk and all the completely unconstitutional things that are happening in our government, completely outside of what the Founding Fathers intended. I often think if, if George Washington and all those guys could come back, what in the world do you think they'd do? I think they'd start a second revolution. I really believe they would. So the man of God will be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works according to the word of God. Second, or excuse me, 1 Peter 3, 14. But if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Hallelujah. And be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Why? Because he's delivered them out of us all. Delivered us all out of those things. We're happy because we're persecuted, because we're doing something right, apparently, or they wouldn't be persecuting us. Second Timothy 2, 12, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. And I tell you what, here in a few minutes I want to read a couple of things, articles about some of the Christians over in the Middle East that have been killed, had their heads cut off by ISIS which is completely demonic, completely driven by the devil in every sense. And I think to myself, if they were to find me today in the U.S., would there be enough evidence to convict me of being a Christian? I believe there would. And when they did, if they held a gun to my head and said, renounce the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what I'd tell them? Ain't no way. Now, either, the, either an angel would deliver me, or I'd be supernaturally transferred out of there, or I'd be a martyr. And there's a whole lot worse things than being a martyr, to tell you the truth. But we've got to take that kind of stand. I don't care. I don't care if the guy at work is looking me in the eye and telling me how I'm a, a hate monger. I look at him and say, no, I'm not. But the word of God's true. I don't care what you say. You've got to take a stand. These are days to take a stand. But I, I like this. If we deny him, he'll also deny us. We need 
to let Christians know. This is part of what I'm trying to do here tonight. And I'm not talk I know I'm preaching in the choir here at the church, but all you folks out there that are watching on the Internet, if you're feeling wishy-washy about your stand with the Lord, you need to start doing some serious praying. And you, not, you need to make a stand personally before that day comes. You've got to know what you're going to do before that day comes. Don't ever deny Him. Not in the least. 1 Peter 3, 17, For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. Absolutely. I'd rather suffer for doing the Word of God any day. 1 Peter 4, 16, If any man suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his behalf. I actually think I've read that earlier. And then finally, Revelation 2, 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now there's not a lot of people that I know personally that have been killed for their faith here in the United States. But you know what? There's a lot of people in the Middle East that know people who've given their lives for the gospel. Now, why does this kind of persecution come? Mark 4, 17, they have no root in themselves and so endure for a time afterward when affliction and persecution arises for the word's sake. That's the reason it's the word of God. Satan wants to stop the word. He doesn't really care that much about us individually, personally, but he cares about the word. And then also, going back to what we were talking about earlier about Paul preaching circumcision, they tried to get him to preach circumcision. They tried to put screws to him to preach false doctrine. He says, why do I yet suffer persecution if I preach circumcision? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Galatians 5.11. They wanted him to preach false doctrine, but he refused to do it. And he said, why am I persecuted if, I, if I'm preaching what you're saying concerning this false doctrine? No, I stand against that. And then finally, let me give you some examples from the news we'll close. Oregon declares war on the Christian faith. This is Charisma Magazine. That's the headline. That'll get you attention. In one of the most egregious anti-Christian acts committed by a state official in recent memory, Oregon Labor Commissioner Brad Avakian not only upheld the ridiculous $135,000 fine levy against Aaron and Melissa Klein for declining to bake a cake, how stupid is that, for a lesbian commitment ceremony, he ordered the Kleins to cease and desist from making public comments about their religious convictions relative to this case. In other words, shut up! By authority of the state, shut up about the Word of God's stand concerning Christian marriage. Think about that. That's Oregon. Last time I checked, that's in the United States of America. And that happened just a few weeks ago. This is the day that we're living in. Coptic Christians persecuted in Egypt, Fox News article. Despite the Christians having agreed to a host of conditions, this is in Egypt, including that the church will be restrict, restricted to a one-story building, have no tower or bells, and that the village Christians apologize to the local Muslims for publicizing their plight in the media. They agreed to all those conditions. The church there did. I wouldn't have done that. But they did that in spite of all that. The police chose the Orthodox Christian Good Friday, April 10th, to storm the Orthodox prayer house on the outskirts of Minya's Magaha City, confiscating altar artifacts on the grounds that worshipers were praying without official permission. They agreed to all their criteria, and they still came down on them. The forces vandalized the contents of the building and seized vessels used for religious rites, claiming the site had no building permit. Yeah, right said EPIR about the raid on the house of St. Yosef Alabar. And then this story, Christian, uh, Egyptian Christians were calling for Jesus during execution by ISIS in Libya. This is in the Christian Post. A number of the 21 Coptic Christians who were recently shown to being beheaded in a horrific video by Islamic State militants in Libya were reportedly whispering the name of Jesus as, the heads, as their heads were being hacked off their bodies. Think about that. They're standing there 
And if you watch the video, they walk up very calmly, they stand there very calmly, and then these guys hack their heads off as they whisper the name of Jesus. Martyrs of the faith. Just as real a martyr as any from the past. And later on, when, when the media noticed that these guys were so calm, they said, wow, their faith must mean a lot to them that they were whispering the name of Jesus and were so calm while these guys were taking their heads off. And then the Islamic militants got together and said, wait a minute, that's making us look bad. So they came out and said, well, we drugged them so that they were, they were all fluffy-headed. No, they wanted them to feel the pain. They didn't want to dull the pain. So they came up with that lie because they were embarrassed that the Christians were showing them up by what they actually believed. Bishop Antonios Aziz Mina of Giza, who called the five-minute video released by ISIS Sunday diabolical, told the Fides news agency that although the militants intended to spread terror through the massacre, they actually made the men martyrs of the faith. In the moment of barbaric execution, he explained, some of the Christians were mouthing the words, Lord Jesus Christ. The last words on their lips was the name of Jesus. And then the last thing they showed was the sea completely red with the blood going in and out and flowing in and out because of the waves. That's the world that we live in right now. And that's why we've got to take this stuff seriously. And when these attacks come, we're not being beheaded to streets, okay? But the attacks are coming, and they're real, and they're in the media, and they're at work, and there are people at colleges and all over the place coming against believers. We're not to kind of shrink back and say, oh, no, I'm not going to stand my ground. No, we need to get bolder. Yeah. pastor was talking about this morning in that message. The devil's made a mistake, a tactical error, because some of these believers had been sitting around counting their change or starting to get some steel in their backbone. And they're going, wait a minute, hold on. What's happening to my country? And a little late to the party, <laughs> they should have seen this years ago. I mean, come on. All you got to do is look at what this guy believed before he became president and what he planned to do. You know, I saw recently, I saw an article, and I hate to say this, but this article made the, the point that this president has been the most successful in achieving his goals of many presidents in the past. Probably one of the most successful because he planned drastic change of this nation he planned to destroy some of the institutions that he's in the process of destroying. He planned every step along the way and announced what he was going to do. And people stood back and said, oh no, we just don't understand. Oh no, we understood. We saw it. And it happened just like we said. And now some of them are, are looking back going, well, you know, they did say that's what he was going to do. Wait a minute. I mean, this guy has been president now for almost eight years. How in the world did that happen? Except Christians didn't do their job. So we need to pray. We need to, we need to have some serious times of intercessory prayer for our nation, praying for those who are in authority, praying for the president. I would like nothing better. I posted a, a, a prayer by George Washington recently on Facebook. And man, I tell you what... I said, if, if President Obama would pray this prayer and mean it, think of what that would mean to this country. Amen. Just take George Washington's prayer. Pray that and mean it. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and Him guiding us and, and changing our heart to be in line with the Word of God. Hallelujah. That's what we need. And people change. I, saw, I just saw posted... I think it was today or yesterday, an ISIS terrorist fighter that said, I've had enough of this and he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Miracles can happen. Just like splitting the Red Sea, I'm telling you, it's, it's just as valid a miracle for one of these guys. I mean, can you imagine? Talk about pain of death. Yeah. Yeah. Talk about setting himself up for martyrdom. 
But praise the Lord, he's saved. And I pray the rest of them get saved. Amen. Jessica posted a thing on Facebook. We need to be praying. We need to be believing for this. Absolutely, it's happening. But we're, we've got to intercede. We've got to pray. We've got to stand our ground. Hallelujah. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.